has to do with entities. You can create a family business, an LLC, a family partnership, and you can transfer property into that so long as the propor proportional ownership going in is the same. Yeah. So if it's three partners buying it together, three partners own the entity, nope, that's not a change in ownership. Then it starts to get a little trickier because once there's over a 50% change inside the, the organization, 50.1, you know, that will trigger a complete reassessment of the property. So this we're talking about, now, we've got this property that's inside of an entity, mm -hmm. like say a corporation, mm -hmm. whatever, and now if the shares of that corporation is what we're talking about, mm -hmm. are transferred to somebody else that wasn't a previous owner, if we get to 51%, boing. Boing, the property will be reassessed inside. And there are reporting requirements that we'll talk about those in yeah. a moment. So the, the entities are tricky. The other problem with the entities is the entities do not qualify by definition for parent-child exclusions. Right. So if you have an entity and you've got parent-child situations going on, you're not gonna, you can't have the parent-child exclusion apply if dad gives shares to son or uh -huh. mom gives shares to daughter. Mm -hmm. So we have some techniques we can use to, to make that work better. Uh, but once again, you've got to be really, really careful because we have found that clients just willy-nilly transfer these interests and don't realize they're going to have a property tax problem. Right. Um, okay. Okay, so... Uh, go, another question, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm sort of well, on here. well, yeah. Uh, but one thing I just wanted to reiterate mm -hmm. uh, so that people understand the importance of what we're talking about. Because like you said, this is a gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. And that is that in some cases, the cumulative tax impact of this change of ownership can exceed, say, income tax savings that you're planning or estate tax or gift tax uh, that, you're, that mm -hmm. you are uh, planning for. And so it's important for everybody, one, for the, you know, uh, our viewers as clients, but also for those that are watching, maybe that are attorneys, whatever, you know, you mm -hmm. know we all need to be aware of this uh, from a planning standpoint to include this as part of the overall uh, uh, process, I guess, if you will, uh, in estate planning and, and business planning, uh, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, because, again, uh, can, you can get a big impact from this, and, and it can be a surprise. Yeah, it can be a surprise. As I, I, I mentioned briefly, the reporting requirements, because you are required to report these things. And when you record a deed, you're supposed to file what's called a preliminary change of ownership report. We call them PCORs for short. And that, that form will has all of these various exclusions on it, including the parent-child. Mm -hmm. And if you check the parent-child box, there's another form you have to fill out, which is a parent-child exclusion form. Mm -hmm. That's also supposed to be sent in with the deeds, too. And of course, what happens is, is that people sometimes do deeds, don't record them. They deliver them, which did transfer title. Uh, or uh, somehow or other they get them recorded without the proper paperwork or they don't fill out the paperwork properly. And these may sit for years. Yes. And all of a sudden, wham, the, the assessor's office finds out that there's been a change in ownership and they will come back and they will issue what's called an escape assessment for every year uh -huh. from the time of the actual change of ownership uh -huh. to now. Yes. Plus interest. Yes. Uh, and they will come after you. And they, uh, it happens with some degree of regularity. And then this past year, um, the state got its act together and its hunt for revenue. Uh, and they now have stronger reporting requirements. They have better coordination amongst the recorder's offices, the assessor's offices, and the Board of Equalization to make sure these things get caught. They also tightened it up because if they catch it, they will send you a notice that you might be eligible for this exclusion and you have 60 days in which to fill it out and if you don't send it back they'll send you another notice mm -hmm. and that for another 60 days and if you don't get back to them after that you lose you will not be able to claim your parent child exclusion where before you could do it for three years uh -huh. now it's tightened it up um, so folks that are transferring real estate around be careful uh, you know, one of the things that I get a lot of clients come in and say, wouldn't it be just simpler if I put my house in my child's name? Yes. Okay, and they go ahead and do that, and then everything goes haywire. One I'm just dealing with right now, the child died before the parent. Uh, so, uh, well, related but to that's, this. But not related to this, but the problem mm -hmm. is, is that they will do this, and, yeah. they, and now that property is scheduled to go to a sibling. 
Yes. Okay, and if it was going like it should be going, it would be going from a parent to another child, but now it's going from sibling to sibling and going to be subject to reassessment uh, because that was not good planning. Um, so it's important that these things be set up uh, the right way and that you get to somebody who understands these, these rules. Um, now, the, and, but the, the example that you brought up, mm -hmm. Uh, it brought something to mind, and that relates to these refinancings and so forth, and that uh, quite often along the way there are title changes that are made related taking properties out of trust and all of this other stuff okay. uh, and, and or getting it into a certain person's name because they're the one that could qualify for the loan. I mean... <laughs> well, those happen. The good news is there is an exception if these people are put on title for, for acquisition of a loan. Uh -huh. And you can say they really didn't have an interest, uh -huh. and you can wiggle your way out of that. But it is dangerous. Yeah. But usually it's parent-child. And the parent-child goes both ways, by the way. Okay. You can go child-parent, too. Yes. And parent-child. So uh, if mom and dad are put on title for the, for the loan, and then you know, a year later they, they, they deed it back, they are eligible for the parent-child exclusion okay. um, for that. So there are, but if it's aunt and uncle, you might have a little more difficulty. Right. Um, and, it, and it seems to me you're playing havoc here with your paper trail, yeah, and not to mention you know potential gift tax issues and other things. Uh, yeah, it's, along it's, the way. it's good just to it's good just to document it all. Okay. We've been talking. To, let me just mention the, the grandchildren. Except right. this yes. this doesn't come up very often, but if if your uh, a grandparent to a grandchild works, you can, it'll also work as the, under the same rules, but both natural parents have to have predeceased. Yes. It's not just the parent, not just the child of the grandparents. It's like there's a void there that yeah. now you can because, jump across. Because there's also, you, the parent-child exclusion also extends to, to daughters-in-laws and son-in-laws. And so that, that, that level has to be gone before both mom and dad are gone. If the grandchild's an orphan, in essence, mm -hmm. then you can have a grandparent-grandchild uh, exclusion. And I've actually I've been doing this a long time, and I've only this only come up twice uh, in in my in my legal career that we had, where we actually had to find the form to claim it, uh, <laughs> so, and it did work. So, uh, okay. Uh, and we actually had to provide certified death certificates of the predeceased parents okay. along with it. So it's, you, they make you jump through the hoops. Yeah. So. Now, with these family exclusions in mind, how can distributions from an estate or trust be structured to avoid reassessment? Well, uh, sometimes you can actually, you know, if the family says, okay, you know, Janie wants to have the family home. Well, give Janie the family home directly and then give something else to the other kids, okay? Or if that's not possible, then uh, so you don't have the sibling transfer, you just got to make sure that you do, you know, that you do the refinancing or whatever, the, wherever the money is going to be generated, even up the, 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 the distributions okay. at the trust level. Okay. Uh, that's an important step in it all. Now, the good news is there is pending a change to the rules at the Board of Equalization that will allow the what you would think would be an easier way to do that, and that is for Janie to, Janie to get the house, get the mortgage on it, and, and pay the money back to the trust, which would be the easier way to do it. And there is a possibility that's going to happen. Okay. Um, and so good stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> What are some gift tax planning considerations related to this? I, I'm, I'm thinking mostly related to smaller transfers and what sort of exemptions that we may be able to use for that. Well, yeah, there's, you know, um, there's a, a special, it, it doesn't really come into play too much here, but for really tiny transfers of 5% or $10,000, mm -hmm. um, those, are, those are exempt too. Now, in our community, those seem pretty absurd. Uh, I can tell you right now, you can buy a nice house in, in, in Crescent City for about $40,000. Uh -huh. And you can see where you could probably give away a house in little pieces yes. uh, and, and fit into that. Mm -hmm. um, or people that might have raw land that's somewhere that's not very valuable. So there are some exceptions where you can give away small pieces and, just, or, you, know, and, and you fit both within the property tax exceptions and you fit within the gift tax exclusions.